turn most of the lights out. Is that okay? You can see better. That's good, yeah. So I've been looking at this subject for a, for a oh, way over a year. I can't remember what started me looking at it. Actually, there was something, little thing was like a, I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I, and I started to look into it. And then I considered about doing a presentation on it. And then a couple of times I thought to drop it because it's such a tricky subject. It's such a tricky, sensitive subject. Slavery altogether. I've been to some slavery museums uh, in, in London. There's one in the West India dock. Uh, and you can almost feel emotion. You can feel emotion, and, um, uh, but every time I went to drop it, something else would come up that I wasn't looking for and get me going again. And then, uh, what is it, a few months ago, I, I kind of decided to, to make a presentation. And I asked her, well, last year here, I was, asking, I was telling people a couple of the facts that I'd found out. Uh, people of African descent or West Indian descent, and they liked it. And then, then I said to uh, uh, someone in Medway that's from an African descent, uh, what would you think? Would you be nervous if I presented this? And he said, no, I'd be interested. Uh, and I think the nervousness is more, more for the white fella, to be honest with you. Uh, so so uh, uh, nothing to be nervous about anyway. So, um, yeah, we did this a, a couple of months ago. In, in a, we went away for a weekend and we hired a village hall, hence the, um, uh, hence the, the, the little uh, lead slide. Okay, he's my mate. He, he hangs around central London. Uh, a, very, a lover of the British, really. Uh, he goes out. He's outside Parliament every day. He's one of those, and uh, yeah, he's a Ghan Ghanaian fella. And he, he's, he obviously likes the Union Jack. The Union Jack plays quite a big part in our story. So, uh, start off a, a brief history and definition of slave trading. Uh, so, uh, this is this is one. You know, mostly when we think about slave trading, we think about the the Atlantic slave trade of people being taken from Africa to America, uh, um, the Caribbean, Cuba, especially Cuba, uh, South America, especially Brazil, because uh, that, that's the history that we know. Uh, and and this, doesn't, this isn't the beginning of slavery, by the way. Uh, do you reckon the Atlantic slave trade uh, with Europeans started in 1444? Not that I've gone into that much detail. Uh, but this is, this is a little bit earlier in, in those centuries. Uh, you can see... Um, uh, people people um, raiding uh, places and taking slaves back to um, Persia. Persia is on that side, and North Africa is on that side, Algeria, Morocco. Uh, that was called the Barbary slave trade. Um, uh, and those people, they would raid Ireland, they would raid England, they would raid Europe, and they would take people and make them slaves if they could catch them. Uh, you know, it's, it's just all, everyone's on ships, obviously, and, uh, well, on that side of the world they are. Uh, and you can see on the east side, they used to raid Eastern Europe and take slaves from Eastern Europe. That's where the, the, the word comes from. It, it's Slav. The word is Slav uh, uh, from, from Slavic people. Uh, so, 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 so that's where, not, not that they were the first or the only ones, but that's where the word comes from. So uh, in, in our imagination, or in, 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 often in our knowledge, um, uh, we, we think of only one type, uh, which was, by the way, so far as I've ever read, the worst. You know, uh, but what, what we'll find is uh, the slave trade is, is ancient. Uh, as I say, that this is uh, uh, th th it went from 1444 to actually 1888. Funny enough, uh, is pretty much a date that I read. I don't know exactly uh, uh, um, a moment that it stopped, but it did stop. And um, you can see in the height from 1650 to 1860 uh, where people were taken from. You can see it's what's called the slave coast there. Uh, right in the middle of there is called the Bight of Benin, which is the water that's outside of uh, a place called Lagos. Uh, and Lagos was and, and north and south of it. Uh, and what would happen is, is, the, is the, uh, the people that were sold would often be from inland, uh, and they would be captured by one tribe would, would dominate another, have war with another. Uh, sometimes it was for religious reasons, and he'd catch people, and he'd take them to the coast, and he'd sell them to Europeans who would, who would take them across uh, South America, um, the West Indies, and uh, America itself, uh, as we know. Um, British, Dutch, Danish, French, Spanish, and Portuguese dominated, it, dominated the, the slave trade. Uh, by the time we pick up our story, 
Uh, the British were, were, the, were, the, were the, um, the biggest traders, the biggest traders in men. Okay, so uh, uh, at the time, uh, well, what I want to look at is, is the, like, it might seem obvious to you that slavery is, is, is against God and against nature, really. Uh, but at the time, one of the things that was interesting was, was, was there's a scriptural argument, because people are, people are held, people are captured slaves both in Africa uh, and, and, um, and the Europeans claimed it to be the law of nature. You know, the law of nature, that, that it was lawful. And, and on, the, on the Western side, the European side, they claimed scriptural um, uh, authority to, 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 to um, employ themselves in that trade. For example, they would say the Eighth Commandment is, is you, mustn't, you mustn't covet your, your neighbor's manservants or maidservants. What they're saying is they had slaves. And you can find references to slavery, uh, people being sold in the Old Testament, uh, and, and all this kind of thing. And uh, what you find is, is um, uh, they had to very much win the argument to prove scripturally to anyone that, that listens, because what's going to happen is a movement's going to start, uh, and, and their moral basis had to be totally sound. Uh, I was reading... Um, uh, for a long time, when I was looking at this, I was looking at the movements, and, and, and the, the people, the, people the, the, the powerful people in the movement were, were very much get, got their inspiration from the Bible. Absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, but I, could, I wasn't finding many scriptures, uh, just the odd one, and some of them were a little bit, you think, ah, well, that's all right, but it doesn't really cover it. And then, and then um, uh, the way people, one of the ways people communicated in those days was people would print lots of pamphlets and booklets, and they'd be passed around. Uh, and I found one from the Library of Congress. This is mostly uh, focused on Britain, by the way, but in America, the movement was going on as well. Uh, and this guy seemed to be an ordinary guy. Uh, he just put forward arguments against uh, slavery. And he made a few very good points. Uh, uh, one of the things, uh, one of the things was, was um, that there are certain things in the Bible uh, that, that you, you can't really be fundamental about and don't matter so much, like, you know, if something's inspired... You know, uh, the nature of God in heaven. Uh, there's not enough scriptures and not enough certain to be certain. Um, there, was a, there was a couple of other things. Uh, but he said there's some other things that, that, that absolutely are absolutely clear. And you must rightly divide the words of truth and make one thing right and one thing wrong. And he included the doctrine of salvation in that. And he also included this doctrine. Is slavery scriptural or is slavery not? There is no middle ground. And he were not going to allow a middle ground. And um, yes, in the Bible, uh, this is from Exodus, this is the law. And he that steals a man and sells him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. And uh, uh, in, in, in the New Testament also, it talks about it. Uh, this is from a, a slightly different version in the King James Version. It says, knowing this, that the Lord is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for fornicators, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for enslavers, or in the King James Bible it says, men stealers, uh, for liars, for perjured persons, and it carries on anything else that's contrary to sound doctrine. Contrary. So, so not only was, was slavery, it was stealing men, uh, it was against the law of God. It was against the law of the God to the point of the death penalty. You can't get much more against the Lord of God than that to the death penalty. And um, as I say, that there were arguments on the other side about, about not coveting your, uh, um, uh, the maid servants or, or, or your man servants. And I, what, what I want to do is say that those things ha has a place and people were sold in the, in the Bible legitimately and there were rules to do with them and to make a difference between what the Bible describes and what was happening at the time. So, so, so there, you know, that, that's the Eighth Commandment, is it? Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Yeah, there's a lot of arguments, you know, you know one, was, um, one was in the New Testament. It says, um, how, much, how much do you owe my master? You know, the unjust steward. How much do you owe my master? Uh, and what happens, in, like in this one guy's argument that I read, I really enjoyed it, and uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, and, he, and he says, um, he answers every point that they raised. So they can answer all them, their points, but they can answer none of mine. None of mine. And, you know, if you compare it to the doctrine of salvation, no compromise. There is no middle bit. There is no middle part. And his argument against that was, you know, because people were saying that, you know, the master, therefore, it was slavery. 
Uh, and he said, no, he said, he said uh, if you're owned by someone, you can own nothing. You cannot own a debt. You cannot be in debt uh, because you are owned. Nothing is yours. Nothing is yours. You are not yours. And uh, the argument just got so strong. Um, uh, th th this is the other side of, uh, th I say there are many scriptures. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve thee, and the seventh year shall go free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife uh, will go out with him. And, and just reading that, you know, that the scriptures, like people are choosing this one over that one. Uh, there's a scripture in the New Testament that says, Can the same fountain send out sweet waters and bitter? Could the same book give two different, totally different doctrines on the same subject? You couldn't run a school like that. You couldn't run anything like that. That if you'd have two different doctrines in the same book, you know, and, and the, the, the difference between the men stealers and the slavery or, or the, this kind of servitude, which is which was allowed for in the Bible, there's two things. One is choice. That you were a part of the deal if you were sold, if you sold yourself to someone for six years. And the other thing, there was an end date. There was an end date, so it was for a, for a, a fixed period of time. Uh, we see a, a lot of this stuff uh, these days in the paper. They, these people that make Man United shirts and all this kind of thing, and they, they get paid 20p an hour and all that. Like, and, and, and there's often a movement over here to, uh, to freedom. And sometimes you hear back from them saying, please don't, because it's all we've got. You know, so even though it's rough, uh, it, there's still, that's not slavery. That's not slavery. Yet it's rough. Yes, it's tough. Uh, but if you took it away from them, they'd have less than they had now. It's just not the same thing. And it is important to make the distinction. Uh, these are people making, making, making the Nike shoes. I think they give it 12 pence an hour. And I think that's Vietnam. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, I, like, as I say, I had this, this, uh, this pamphlet from the, from, I didn't read it all because it was so, so intense. Um, uh, from the, it was from the Library of Congress. Uh, you know, one of the many people that printed things arguing heartily and very well uh, that, that slavery, if you believe the Bible, you would believe that it's against the law of God and the law of nature. And uh, 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 one of the little sayings was, the Bible is the lamp of life lighting the path of duty. And I, I just liked it as a saying. And uh, uh, there was an argument uh, in, in this pamphlet, and it says, this is what it is if you, if you sell a man. It says, um, it says, man sunk to a thing. The intrinsic element, the principle of slavery, men bartered, leased, mortgaged, bequeathed, invoiced, uh, uh, shipped in cargoes, uh, stored as goods, taken on, ex taken on, on executions, and knocked off a public outcry. Their rights and others, uh, uh, conveniences, their interest, wares are on sale, their happiness, a household utensil, their personal inalienable ownership, a serviceable article or a plaything, as it best suits the humour of the hour, their deathless nature, conscience, social affection, sympathies and hopes, marketable commodities, we repeat, the reduction of persons to things. It says, not robbing man of privileges, but of himself, not loading him with burdens, but making him a beast of burden. Not restraining liberty, but subverting it. Not curtailing rights, but abolishing them. Not inflicting personal cruelty, but, but annihilating personality. Not exacting involuntary labor, but sinking man unto an implement of labor. Not abiding, not abridging human comforts, but abrogating human nature. Not depriving an animal of immunities, but despoiling a rational being of attributes. Uncreating a man to make room for a thing. And the argument just got more and more powerful. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not just a technical argument. It's a heart-winning argument. You know, and as I say, no compromise and very similar in, in, in many senses to the true and false gospel. So uh, uh, going back now, you, you know, we, we, we can see more in, in Genesis. Uh, 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 Joseph uh, was sold by his brothers, almost certainly, uh, somebody was telling me later, it's not 100% clear what happened there. But let's just say, say that he was for now, you know. Uh, um, there's, a li there's a little scripture that's a little bit hard to understand. And uh, um, it says, his brother says, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and lay not hands on him, for he is our brother. You know the rest of the story, don't you? Our own flesh. And he pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Uh, uh, and this, this, is, uh, this, this, was, this was Joseph's 
account of what happened to him. He says, For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in, into the dungeon. He was stolen. He had no say, there's no end date. This is that. This is that. And uh, it's interesting that he's stolen. Uh, uh, there's no law at this time. Law comes later. This is the law of nature. This is the law of God written on people's conscience. Uh, the, the, the mug, by the way, is, is available for 13 Canadian dollars in Canada. So uh, the Canadians have got a good little record about, about slavery. Somebody was telling me a couple of little stories after they'd done this presentation. Um, uh, not, not effective like the British, uh, but hearty like the British. Well, hearty like the reasonable men. Uh, good little stories. So... Uh, and this is the brothers saying, and they said to one another, we are, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we, we, we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben said to them, spoke, not, spoke I not unto you, saying, do not sin against the child, and yet he would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. It's interesting that they felt guilty. There's no suggestion that the Ishmaelites and the uh, Midianites felt guilty. But they felt guilty. These, these are Israelites. And uh, uh, again, you know, these things were used in the arguments uh, like a machine gun to absolutely wreck anybody's idea that you could use the Bible to justify this. No. You know, and these things were strong. Uh, these things were strong, you know. Um, getting towards the end of this, hopefully. This part, it says... Um, uh, again, you know, just a, the distinction. Uh, um, don't mix the two things up. It says, um, this is Joseph when he's, when is, when is the, the, is the death in Egypt. It says, when that year was ended, they came to him the second year, this is the people of Egypt, to Joseph, and said to him, we will not hide from my lords how our money is spent and the herds of livestock of my lords. There is nothing left in the sight of my lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our lands? Buy us and our, our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and die that the land won't be desolate. So here's, here's the, the, the thing that was legitimate and the thing that there are many laws about. Selling yourself because it was the better option. You know, in, in, in our world, footballers are bought and sold. Uh, uh, but not, that's not slavery. You know, uh, uh, they have a, a part to play in it uh, and, and they're better off because of it and all that. And it's quite distinct. Uh, they're quite distinct. Uh, choice, as I say, it's a matter of choice and time limited. But they did sell their bodies. Uh, the movement, so um, uh, there's a little bit of history involved here. Where do we start? Uh, if we pick it up in, in the, in the mid-1700s, uh, so people are moving en masse from Africa to, to, to the New World, uh, and the British traded very much in slaves. Uh, they were really starting to, um, to become great, you know, as a trading empire, and um, slavery was part of that trade. And in England, there was much disquiet, and uh, in, in Clapham, uh, well, in Parliament, there was a group of MPs called the Saints. Uh, and they were very much anti-slavery. Uh, they were abolitionists. Uh, and they tried uh, um, to get the law changed. It took quite a while. Uh, many failures. You know, last year, not, not that I'm making a comment on it, uh, Theresa May was, was constantly bringing a deal back to Parliament, wasn't she? And being rejected. Well, that was happening with this. That was happening with this, just at the turn of the century, which is jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, at one time, he brought this bill to, to, to abolish the slave trade, which is not the same as abolishing slavery. I'll explain that in a minute. And uh, they lost by four votes because uh, a lot of the guys were, were at the opera. A lot of the guys were at the opera, otherwise they would have won. They call it Clapham sect. Uh, um, uh, and as well as the people in Parliament, there were other people, Quakers. And uh, a few Quakers played a, a very big part. Uh, they were interesting people at that time. Very interesting people, but they wouldn't take seats as MPs. And uh, when, when I read that, I thought, ah, you know, uh, uh, I wonder why. And uh, they wouldn't swear the oath. They wouldn't swear allegiance to, to, to the king. Not, not, not that they wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, faithful to the king or to the queen. It's because, because the Bible says don't swear an oath. You know, and it's a bit like in court. Uh, some people won't swear on the Bible because they believe it. So, so that, was, that, was the, uh, that was the Quakers. Quakers are... Quakers, uh, uh, for, for a long period of time, there's just something about them. There's just something about them. Very effective people. Uh, uh, often spirit-filled. 
uh, yes, you know, it's hard to always tell. And uh, um, uh, the movement, so, so around England at this time, there's a movement. Uh, you've got to understand in England, uh, most people wouldn't have seen slaves. There were very few slaves in England. Uh, the ships traded them, they'd bring them to the ports and take them. There was a three-way trade. Uh, but they didn't really bring them into England. They took, they took them to the New World. So lots of people will have never seen it. Uh, so, so what the abolitionists would do, would go around the country, uh, uh, maybe with a man in chains. I don't, I don't know if that's the case, even that's the cartoon. Uh, but, the, but the shackles and the things they used in ships to hold them down, they take the evidences around to people and fire up this movement. And uh, it was some movement. And the petition's going in. Um, uh, uh, this is a fella called Granville Sharp. Uh, he lived in London, and um, I, th I think there's, uh, he, he challenged somebody uh, that, was, that, that, had, that had a Jamaican in London who claims it, he was, it was his property and he, he beat him up so badly uh, that he ended up in four months in hospital. And, and he joined in and challenged him legally if he could do what he was doing in England. Uh, and he, he won that case. Uh, and then he became well known as somebody that Negroes in trouble could go to. He taught himself law. He taught himself law uh, because he wanted to uh, uh, use the law to, to put pressure on uh, uh, the government uh, that this is, this is not right. You know, and, and, and um, uh, yes, uh, there's a famous case called the Somerset case. Where he, where he, where he, he came across a, a, a man who was going to be sold, and uh, he got it taken to court. There's a thing. I think it was a little bit like the thing in Acts the other day, uh, habeas corpus, which, like in, in, the, in the laws of the Romans, can you judge any man before you hear him? Uh, well, in, in English law, there was a thing called habeas corpus where you could claim someone if there's a case. They have to be brought before the court to stand there. They have to stand there to be heard and to be seen, and a judgment made. Uh, and he brought this case of James Somerset. Uh, claiming, is this man somebody else's property? Can somebody be somebody else's property in this country in that sense? And uh, um, uh, the, the judgment he got was, was uh, as soon as a man comes to England, he is free. He may be a villain in England, but not a slave. Uh, and the, the guy that was the, um, the Lord Chief, Chief Justice, apparently it went from January to May. He kept putting it off. He kept putting off the judgment because he knew the judgment was enormous. This was, this, was the, this was the money of the country. This was the prosperity of the country. Even though it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the vastness of it abolishing the slave trade, it was going to be the beginning of it. And it was to see what is legal, what is lawful. Uh, and uh, um, English law, is, is, it comes from, you know, basically what the Bible, the, the Bible would teach is right and fair, which is what is right and fair. Yeah, that's what it is. The two things are the same. Uh, the Lord Chief Justice was Lord Chief Justice Mansfield, and uh, there's, there's a saying attributed to him at the time, which might not have originated from him, but it's a very interesting one, I thought. Who speaks Latin? We need posh people in the fellowship, <laughs> don't we? Yeah, no, we need more posh people in the fellowship. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. <laughs> I do like a bit of Latin. It means, let justice be done, though the heavens fall. No matter what the cost to the country, no matter what the awkwardness of, of what you're going to change, what's right is what you go with. And um, uh, uh, that is great. You know, that is great. Uh, and that really uh, uh, started to um, uh, turn things around. You know, just a couple of scriptures to go with that. Uh, uh, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honours them to fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. It purely from a righteous perspective. Right? Uh, and again, the, the other th what, one of the other things that comes through all the time with this is, is, uh, is, is it's all right making right judgments and uh, uh, right decisions, but you've got to be sincere about them. It's no good saying them and then turning a blind eye to what actually goes on. And that also is a vital part of our story, both then and now. You know, uh, let's not love indeed. Uh, uh, yeah, you can read it for yourself. It's interesting that Lord Mansfield has a, has a stepdaughter at home who's quite famous, really. She was, her name was Dido Bell, uh, and she was the daughter of a, a Jamaican uh, trader. 
and, and he'd brought her home. Uh, uh, and, but she, she, she was as his own daughter. She wasn't, and and the other, one of the other things that where your perspective changes when you read all this stuff is, is the perspective of people at the time. You know, what you find is the, the abolitionists were not condescending, they were not patronizing. I'll prove that to you. And in England, there was as much equality in the early 1800s as there was now, no, not, maybe not quite now, but not far off. Not far off at all. So uh, Dido Bell was Lord Mansfield's stepdaughter, but he still put off the judgment. Uh, Granville Shah, uh, he, he very quite a heroic guy, really, and uh, he met this man, uh, um, Oladu Iquano. Uh, the, the interesting, um, the interesting narrative of the life, and, and he'd been a slave, and I think I don't know, I think he's escaped, uh, you know, and ended up in England, and um, he he wrote a book about his experiences. Uh, it went to nine editions. This is in the late 1700s in, in, in England. It went to nine editions, and again, it fueled the movement. But again, it tells you about the, the time that, that we're talking about. Uh, uh, he's a, he, he can write a book, and the book will be published, and the book will be sold, and the book will be respected, because he's got something to say. That's what it was like, you know? Uh, he met Granville Sharp. He, he had a lot to do with him, actually. Uh, uh, this was an interesting one because Sharp now is he, he, he's on he's on the legal warpath, and um, there's a famous case called the, the Zong massacre. And what happened? There was a ship called the Zong, and it had it had slaves taking them to the West Indies, I think. And he got into trouble, so they dumped the slaves in the sea. I think they ran out of food or water. I can't remember what it was. They dumped the slaves slaves in the sea. Uh, and that wasn't that wasn't the, And then they claimed on the insurance for the loss of their property in London, and he challenged that. He challenged that legally, he challenged it, and he won, he won. Again, things are on the move now, uh, and he won. Uh, he wanted them charged with murder, and he, he, he didn't win that, but he won this thing, because what he's saying is they are not property. Uh, and again, uh, um, uh, yeah, the wrong mask, it's quite fit, you can, you can, you can Wikipedia all these things. Uh, so it says um, uh, the society of affecting the abolition of the slave trade uh, uh, adopted this in 1787 so it's all around the same, same time uh, you can just about make it out it's a man in chains holding up his hands he's not praying I don't think and it says at the bottom am I not a man and a brother it's a question it's aimed at people's hearts and uh, uh, it, 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 says, it says there about it, that it was sent to, um, uh, this is a medallion sent, uh, made by Wedgwood. People have heard of Wedgwood, China and all this type of thing. He'd put things on his plates and on his things uh, along these lines. This movement was big. It was big. And um, uh, the, 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 the Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade uh, um, met often. There's lots of Quakers there. Uh, and he wanted Shaw to be the chairman. And apparently, so as not to be made the chairman, he always turned up a little bit late. You know, so he wouldn't make him, he wouldn't make him the boss, you know what I mean? And, uh, yes. So it, it, says, it says there about um, uh, medallions, popular and persuasive political ornaments on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, um, pendants, uh, inlaid in snuff boxes, everywhere you go, propaganda. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing, and they were determined to do it. Uh, he set up a place in, in, in um, I think it was in Sierra Leone, called Granville Town. And uh, uh, he sent a ship out to set out, uh, uh, because, because if you're going to start freeing people, you need somewhere for them to go. You can't send them home, because they just get slaved again. They just get sold again. And uh, so he set up this place called Granville Town. It was a disaster, really. One of the interesting things is the first ship that goes over to Granville Town to set up this place as a, as a, as a place of refuge for people, um, uh, 60 of the, of, the, of the black men on the boat had white wives. So there'd be people from London and the people from America. They were all part of this movement. They had white wives. Again, just to show you the, the, way, the, the, the way things worked. It, it didn't work at all, that one I think they had. Uh, it was very hard for, um, to establish a foothold in Africa uh, because you were surrounded by hostility. You were against their wealth as well, by the way. And the other thing for white people, there was, there was disease. 
Uh, malaria was terrible, and um, they thought it was in the air. Uh, that's why it's called ba malaria, there's bad air. Yeah, but that killed a lot, and sleeping sickness killed a lot. And I was reading about there was a place, that, there's a bite of Benin, and there was a little poem about it. Uh, uh, beware of the bite of Benin. One, one comes out where 40 went in. You know, going on to the mainland was, 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 was uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, so there you go, there's, there's a medallion. Uh, there's some of the China. It was have the women as well. Am I not a woman and a sister? Uh, there was a women's movement to do with this. You know, again, people, people got themselves going and they got themselves into it. Uh, and um, as I say, in the early part, that was the only scripture that I ever came across, really, was Hebrews, you know, about remember those who are in bonds as being yourself in the body. And you think it doesn't really cover everything. It doesn't really enlighten you uh, against the arguments from the other side. But other people did. Just part, just part of the, um, again, part of the movement in the late 1700s. This is two people called uh, John Newton. People have heard of John Newton, Amazing Grace. Uh, and William Cowper, I've never heard of him. He was a poet. And um, he wrote, um, the, Lord the Lord moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. If you read the rest of that, it's quite nice. And uh, he was a bit, he was, half the time he was insane. And, uh, 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 but the rest of the time he was quite lucid. Uh, and again, uh, I think there's a museum to do with these. They, they had a lot to do with each other. Uh, there's a museum about them in Olney, which is near Peterborough, is it? And, uh, but he, he wrote this. In, in a, I think it's supposed to be a poem. It doesn't rhyme, but I liked it. He's a very, very popular man as well, by the way. That's the point. It's not just that I haven't found something obscure. Uh, if you were in the 1780s, you'd, you'd know this guy. It says, we have no slaves at home. This is that the, the Lord has proved that. Uh, if you breathe our air, it says, you are free. Right, that's, that's what the law proved to be. We have no slaves at home, then why abroad? Slaves cannot breathe in England if their lungs receive our air. That moment they are free. The Lord had, had, had proved that or, or decided that or determined that. They touch our country and their shackles fall. That's noble and bespeaks a nation proud. And jealous of the blessing spreads it then. And jealous of the blessing spreads it then. And let it circulate through every vein. What he's saying is if it's okay here, why shouldn't it be okay everywhere? He's not happy. They're not content. They're not content uh, with, with, with what they've got. Um, uh, uh, they want more. And it's, it's a good argument. And it goes along uh, with, with, with the mentality that God had put in this nation, which is from Genesis, you know what I mean? This is what will befall you in the last days. Uh, we'll, pass, we'll pass on that one. Yeah, yeah just th that's, in the, that's in the museum. Uh, but again, at the bottom it talks about uh, about remembering when they were bondmen in Egypt, uh, uh, the, the abolition movement was was, was enormous. Uh, there was a thing f for people that were enslaved called a slave Bible. So in the likes of America, uh, they would allow people a Bible, but they'd take lots of it out. Most of Exodus would have to go. <laughs> you know, movements of God's people and the things to do with Joseph, they wouldn't be in it. So there's massive chunks missing uh, uh, from the scriptures. And... Um, uh, the, 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 I was reading the thing ages ago that uh, in some states in America, uh, they wanted to treat slaves better and educate them, give them a proper education. Somebody said, well, if you give them a proper education, it won't, it won't satisfy them. It'll make them more want to be free. And that was true. It was just wrong. And, and the only thing, the only solution it was abolition. There is no other solution. You know, there aren't two. Being kind didn't work. 1801 and all that. So, so, so we're getting, getting into our... Um, things changed, you know, if you know, if you know the history of, uh, um, uh, well, well, let's read anyway. Five covenants of the Old Testament. Noah, which is to do with the weather and the planet, which is enforced today, right? Which, which will give you hope and peace and save you money, right? Uh, it's it's, it's uh, uh, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the law, the Davidic, the throne, uh, the New Testament. Uh, we're looking at the Abrahamic uh, to, do with, to do with Abraham. Uh, the call of Abraham, I will, I, will, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make thy name great. You will be a blessing. Bless them that bless and curse them that curse you. And all the families of the earth will see be blessed in you, through you. Uh, I think it's Joseph. I love this. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, 1801. Uh, so, so in the Old Testament, there was a curse upon Israel, a seven times punishment. And the part that's to do with Britain, without going into pretty much any detail, goes from seven... 
1 uh, BC uh, to 1801, it's 2,520 years. And in 1801, uh, uh, it, it, it became the union of Great Britain and, and, and Ireland, or, or whatever, whatever the right title is, Great Britain. And that, that was when the flag became full. Uh, it was Union Jack was like that. 1606, they added this cross, and the Union Jack came into place in 1801. Uh, and I'm going to show you that that was, was, was a vision of redemption for many people when they saw that flag. Uh, it was also, things started to change in the country as well. Um, I love this scripture. It says, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. The arches have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength and his arms and his hands were made strong by the mighty God of Jacob. And, and the idea is that the goodness goes outside as well as inside over the wall. And uh, uh, that's what we're going to see here. Um, uh, what's the next one? Okay, yeah. Battle of Trafalgar. So, so he, 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 um, the important thing about the Battle of Trafalgar is, is um, from, from this point onwards, uh, Britannia rules the waves. You know, they defeated the French at, um, uh, at Trafalgar and, and other places in the world as well, in, in Egypt and this type of thing. And now for the first time in history, uh, Britain rules the waves, which gave it power. But some people had power and other people had desire. And, and you needed the two. Uh, it's interesting on the HMS Victory, which was built in Chatham, by the way, uh, there were nine West Indians listed in the crew. There were nine West Indians listed in the crew, and, and they were heroes of the nation. If you ever go to um, Nelson's Column in London, there's a picture there, and uh, I don't know if you can see it. Can I, can I make this bigger? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, can you? Ah, I don't want that. I can't, it's hard to see, but in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the corner there is what's obviously a black boy, a young black man. Uh, we've got a kid in our fellas, but I think he looks like a frame. You can tell me later. He totally denies it, but I think that is, that's his doppelganger. Uh, he, 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 he's on the biggest heroic monuments in Britain. He's recorded there, right? So anyway, there he is. Look, that's that frame and all the people said. Even Ephraim has got to say that. He's not having it, is he? So, yeah. The abolition of the slave trade in 1807. So they were constantly bringing it before Parliament. And uh, they had a debate. I think it's, I can't remember, February or something, 1807. And this guy gets up, an MP gets up. He says, I can give you 20 reasons not to abolish the slave trade. He said, but once I give you the first one, you don't need the other 19. He says, we cannot he says, we cannot, we can relinquish it, we can stop trading, but then the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, the Spanish will take our trade. And what's the point of that? We relinquish our trade. And there's a thing called virtue signaling. This isn't quite that, you know what I mean? So you do the right thing, but no good comes of it. And that was, his, and that was quite a strong argument. Uh, uh, but at the same time, this other thing is going on where we're starting to rule the waves. And anyway, they had a vote. Uh, in Parliament, and um, uh, yeah, anyway. I'll show you that again. Yes, it's quite famous, the Clapham sect. Uh, this is a 200-year a, 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 a coin, two-pound coin. I've got this in our house, somebody give it to me. I'm going to give it to them back one day, but at the moment I'm holding on to it. If you've got any of these, I love them. Absolutely love them. Uh, yes. 23rd of February 1807, they had a vote to abol abolish the slave trade, and they voted 283 to 16 to abolish it. Uh, it was quite an emotional day. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, this was Britain pretty much at the time. Uh, so, so we controlled uh, much of India, South Africa, a few little dots in um, the West Indies, a little bit of uh, Australia and part of Canada, and now we've abolished, to, to, now we've voted to abolish the slave trade. So, yeah, what's going to happen next? Uh, it says, after the vote, the House of Commons rose almost to a man and, and, and turned towards Wilberforce in, in a burst of parliamentary cheers. Suddenly, above the roar of hear, hear, and quite out of order, three hurrahs echoed uh, and echoed while he sat, head bowed, tears streaming down his face. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, it's quite a strong thing. Uh, 
There, that, that's on that's on the church in Clapham where they where they used to meet, uh, um, some of them. And uh, there, it's got the date 1833, not 1807, uh, because there's two distinct parts of this. You can abolish a trade, which we're going to look at how that how that actually worked in practice, uh, but that wouldn't help anyone that that was sold ten years before. You know, you stop people trading, but that wouldn't stop people being slaves that have been sold before. And later on in the 1830s, they voted to abolish slavery. And that was a big jobby, right? You're talking about it all around the world. So uh, uh, it was established in... in, in uh, uh, w w what they did, they sent... Uh, the Royal Navy sent 20% of its ships to the coast of West Africa. Uh, and anyone coming out with slaves on... Uh, they would take the slaves, take them to this place that they'd established, Freetown, that's why it's called Freetown, in Sierra Leone, uh, and they would take the ship and either sell, use, or sink the ship. Uh, over the period that we're looking at, they sank 1,600 ships. They sank six, and some of them they didn't, they, some of them they burnt on the spot because they weren't worth dragging to, to, to Sierra Leone. Uh, others they used, 1,600 ships they sank. This is not virtue signaling. This is not. And, uh, um, so they take the slaves that they, they rescued off the ships to Freetown. Uh, the Anglicans were there. Um, the Anglicans taught them uh, in, these, in these schools they set up. Uh, the alphabet, the word of God, the use of the plough, decency in dress, and abolition. You know? Uh, it's not so much the religion that the British took out, by the way. It was, it was, it was, the, it was the, the way things are run. Uh, that's really what they took out, and a sincerity about it. Yes, it didn't always. Oh, it, it, gosh! It, w w w when you read the ins and outs of what happens over the next 50 years, it was desperate at times. It wasn't easy at all. It just wasn't a doddle. And uh, it, one of the problems, uh, Granville Sharp. Because he, he'd, he'd walk along, he lived in Mincing Lane in the city of London, and he'd walk along the London docks, and sometimes he'd see things, and he'd kick off legally, and he, he, he rescued this one man that was, that was he, you could see him on a ship because he was being whipped. And he does this habeas corpus thing, gets him to court, gets him freed. Uh, they called him Harry Domain. Uh, they used to get English names just about all the time. And he sent him to Freetown, and Harry Domain uh, uh, abandoned Freetown and went back to slaving people. He went back to slaving people. And, uh, you know, one thing to bear in mind is being a victim doesn't make you good. It doesn't make you good. And, and uh, so, so, so there was lots of, um, um, yes. Uh, they were called uh, the, the ships they sent, 20% of the Royal Navy, which was very big, was sent there, called the Preventative Squadron or the West Indian Squadron. If you, if you, the, the first rules were, first of all, they were people called privateers. Yeah, but that, that's, I'm not going to go into that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into that. And, and then it's the Royal Navy. And the deal was that if you captured a ship and you took the slaves off, then you, you get money for each slave you got off a reward and part of the part of a cut of the, um, the sale of the boat or, or if the boat was sold. And uh, so there was money in it for them. But it was a very risky enterprise. There was so much disease, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, so many, I think 1,500 sailors uh, uh, died in the West India Squadron, uh, uh, mostly of natural causes. Uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were better there, uh, because they'd stopped the shit, like, right, yeah, where, where are we going? Yes. Uh, this is one, um, yeah, you, you can read that for yourself. £40 a man, £30 a woman, £10 a child in good health delivered to the British authorities of Freetown. Okay. Uh, they had a right to, well, well, he took upon themselves a right to search. First of all, uh, in, the, in the early years, the, the rule was, that you could, um, you could, um, uh, what's the words if you go onto another ship? And board, yeah, thank you. You, 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 you could board another ship, um, and if they had slaves, then you'd caught it. If they have no slaves, there's nothing you can do. So what they used to do, the slavers, when they saw the British come, and they'd throw them overboard. they just throw them overboard. And uh, then they changed the law, and the law then was, was if they had the, uh, the wherewithal to, to have slaves, then they were a slave ship. Right, they changed that quite quickly. There was one ship they caught after they changed the law. And uh, as the British were approaching, loads of barrels went overboard. Loads of barrels went overboard. And he got on the ship and he had to look around. He said, uh, what are you doing? He said, we're not we're traders. We're not, we're not slavers. We're just traders. And he said, why have you got so much water? 
because he used to load water by the ton. Uh, and he had far more water than need for the crew. And then he realized what was in the barrels. You know, uh, uh, it, was, it was very, uh, um, yes. Uh, the British persuaded other countries to um, legally, uh, to outlaw, outlaw slavery. Uh, there's a thing called the Treaty of Vienna, I think. And um, uh, so many countries had laws that outlawed slavery, but their people, their, 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 their tradesmen just ignored it. And uh, um, it hadn't been outlawed. I, I think we had no agreement with America. So uh, what slave ships would do, if there wasn't an agreement, they would, they would find a flag of that country and pull it up. And the British weren't supposed to touch them, but they ignored them. They just ignored them uh, and, and boarded the ships. Uh, yeah, le legal challenges. So um, without going into too much detail, um, he here is a nation, Britain, with a force in international waters boarding ships of other countries. And the claim is that's legally dubious, which is actually, it's quite an argument. And, and for a while, they, they, went on, they went on this idea uh, that, that uh, um, if you're, say if you've got a French flag and your country has outlawed slavery, then it's your job to prove in your courts that you should be doing what, what you're doing and not our job to prove that you shouldn't be before you start. So, so they would take them and they would have to disprove, they would have to prove that it was okay in their own legal uh, areas. And, and, and it, that was quite successful for a while because they, they, they were very tricky, the slavers, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, there's money involved. So, yes, uh, uh, 10 years later, they had, they had more of a problem in, in, the, in the, that that was challenged in courts and uh, uh, they lost. They didn't have no right to, to board uh, other countries' ships. So, so what they did in, in, that, in that case, they just went around Europe and, and just a, a stronger diplomatic um, uh, pressure, you know, to get countries to allow them to board ships and all this time. There's an interesting thing, I think it probably comes along a little bit later, whereas the French sent warships to the coast of Africa to stop their, their people doing the illegal thing that the British weren't allowed to stop, and he just let them go. It was just in words only, you know what I mean? Well, the words were right and the people were in the right place, but no one did anything, stood there. Abolition of slavery. So, as I say, in, 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 uh, they, they've abolished the slave trade uh, and they're battling to, to enforce that. Uh, but there are slaves still in the West Indies and uh, o other places. Some of them had nothing to do with us. Uh, and they, they passed a, a law in Parliament to outlaw the slave tra uh, slavery. Uh, and then uh, the next thing then is um, uh, how do you do that? So they had to compensate people that own slaves. You know, there's an argument now that it should have been the slaves that were compensated, but you wouldn't have got nowhere if you'd have gone that way. You know, you know, you just wouldn't have got anywhere. Uh, the first year after he decided to abolish slavery, 40% of GDP in Britain was spent uh, on, on paying compensation for people to free slaves. 100 billion pound in today's money. That's the first year. 40% of GDP. Uh, uh, by bearing in mind, by this time, Britain is prospering hand over fist. Right? Remember, remember the earlier judgment? Uh, uh, let justice be done though the heavens fall could have cost us everything and, that, and now it's, it's, it's this way uh, so the other thing they started to do at that time as well as the, as well as the West Af Africa squadron they started to send diplomats into Africa itself onto the mainland uh, tribal mainland, lots of kings uh, to persuade them to give up the trade and um, uh, which is very difficult, it is one. It says, Martin Meredith quotes um, a, a fellow called Gizo telling the British, the slave trade has been the ruling principle of my people. It's the source of their glory and wealth. Their songs celebrate the victories and, and, their mother, and the mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph over an enemy reduced to slavery. It's in their blood, you know? Uh, uh, it was such a, such a task they'd taken on, such a task. And so, so, so they, they'd go... Um, uh, they would go, um, they would send diplomats over and, and, and then try to persuade the kings, these kings of, of, of s s small areas, quite big areas sometimes, to abolish 
uh, the, the stop trading and and uh, and that we would we would trade with them we would send them stuff we would teach them how to uh, or, or, or help them to find other things to trade and it wasn't wasn't just a law it was there was help as well and um i think i think uh, uh, somebody was sent to this um is this the one yeah king geese over to homie quite a nice name in it and and uh, it, uh, a british diplomat called i can't remember his name now um i'll tell you his name in a minute because it comes up uh he went over to this king. One of the things as well, by the way, they go to a king and he say, you know, abolish the slave trade. He says, well, even if I agreed with you, if I went to my people tomorrow and said, we're abolishing it, he said, I won't be, I won't be the king tomorrow. You know, it's just not so simple. <laughs> it's a tricky business. And anyway, they sent a diplomat to the king of, uh, the king of Dahomey uh, and he said, no, he wouldn't. Uh, and he had, he had uh, uh, in his court a six-year-old girl from another tribe that they captured. She was a slave, and her destiny, uh, it, anyone that died in his course, any important person, she would die to be his servant in the afterlife. That was her destiny. She was a slave. Uh, so so um, uh, this diplomat, whose name I, I will find out in a minute, uh, he said, give me her for the white queen in England. Victoria is now on the throne. And they said, okay. So she came back to England. Um, she came back to England. Uh, that's her, uh, where's her name? Ah, where's her name? There it is. Sarah Bonetta Forbes, her name is. Sorry. Sarah Bonetta Forbes. And uh, Queen Victoria adopted her as her 10th child. Okay, so again, the lie of the land. And uh, I read a thing from a history website, which is up to date. And it says she treated her like a poodle. She treated her like a daughter. She paid for her education. Uh, she lived in um, a different, mostly London. Uh, she married uh, in a Nigerian businessman that made his money in London. Quite a rich guy. That wasn't happy, apparently. And she died quite young. Um, uh, and um, who's been to our hall in Gillingham? Right. Uh, that lady lived in the same street as our hall for a while. She, she lived in Canterbury Street in a, in a place called Palm Cottage. There's, 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 a, there's a plaque on the wall to her. Yes. So the Queen, the queen uh, paid for her education. And, um, yeah, I think she died quite young. That's the plaque in Canterbury Street in Gillingham. I, I nearly fell off the couch when I found that out. I know it doesn't mean anything to... Uh, you know, just again about the political, the political um, thing you see now about all the evil. and the, All this good is covered over. This is a picture... And this picture was used in the, in the National Archive, which you think is in queue. He has an exhibition on the evils of the slave trade. And it was evil. I don't doubt that about it. He put this picture up as an example of uh, the British um, uh, being evil. And somebody said, that's not that. That is people being freed and not people being enslaved. And they knew that. And it had to be that because it's a photograph. You know, it's 1857 or something. They knew that, and he still put it up to portray this uh, uh, and to cover over this other part. Uh, this is a well-known... Uh, uh, he, he, was, he was enslaved when he was four years old. What's his name? Samuel Crowder. Uh, he was enslaved when he was four years old with his father, I think, uh, and they, the British stopped the ship coming out. They rescued him, took him to Freetown, took him to school, uh, educated him, uh, and he, he, he became the first bishop of Lagos. Uh, he's well known by Nigerians. He's in, very much a big player in their history. He translated the Bible into Yoruba. Uh, and he, he wrote this brief history of the Yoruba people. Uh, yes. Uh, in the end, the British, uh, um, what is now Nigeria, which is a British construct, by the way, um, pushing together the peoples to the end of the earth is what the Bible says they would do. Um, in the end, they, they took part of Nigeria as, as a protectorate. So they began to govern part of Nigeria as a protectorate to stop the trade. Right? And again, they brought laws and good trading uh, uh, systems and, um, uh, and, and, and a sincerity about law. That's what they brought. And that's why they brought it. And that's why they were there. Okay, who knows this fella, George Osborne? So I was saying, I was saying in 18, nearly there, sorry, in, in, in 18, whatever it was, or other, 1833, 
1834, 40% of GDP was spent on paying people to, to let the slaves go. One of the great arguments, by the way, it was, it, there was all sorts. It wasn't just money. There was forceful arguments, forceful diplomacy. Uh, one of the things was, was, was you'll get more if you pay them than if you don't. You know, you'll get more out of a laboring man that has a hope and an aim than you will out of a slave that has none. And that's absolutely true. It's, apparently, it's proven to be true. So you've got it coming from every angle. And um, uh, so in 18, they paid the, the 100 billion pound in today's money, 40% of GDP. Well, they didn't have that money, so they borrowed it off banks, the Rothschilds and all this. Patrick here, I don't know Patrick. I, they just borrowed the money, right? And uh, so um, they have to pay that back. When do you think they finished paying it back? 2015, they, paid, they finished paying that back. 2015, the last payment was made to do with the bonds that were used to pay off people to end the trade, to end slavery, not the trade, to release people, to free them. The people were freed. We paid for it. We paid for it. You know? Uh, um, uh, that's not virtue signaling. Just finishing off, there was slavery in East Africa, uh, which is 1,400 years. That was, that was um, uh, far worse. And really, I'm nearly at the end. It centered in a place called Zanzibar, and the British went to Zanzibar, and it says, under strong British pressure, the slave trade was officially abolished in 1876. Uh, uh, actually, properly finished in 1897. That was, the, that was where the Arab slave trade, which is a horror story altogether. But that, I don't want to mention that, because I don't want to say they were worse than us. It, it's no good. It's just no good. I'm, I'm nearly done. Uh, that, that's a certificate of someone that's been freed. A legacy. So, uh, uh, good things that came out of a very bad thing. Uh, this, is a, this is a lady, an American poet. "'Twas worse, twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God and that there's a saviour too. Once our redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race, race with scornful lie. Their colour is a diabolical dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as Cain, may be defined and join the angelic train. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the black as Cain thing. I don't think Cain's got anything to do with anything. And, um, at all, and um, uh, but you, 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 one of the things was was uh, uh, the discovery that that uh, I remember I was watching Pastor Ron Carsley, and and he he had uh, assemblies in Africa. He looked after them, and he was in Australia once, and he said, uh, talking about what to know about Africa. He said the first thing to know is that is Africans are as sophisticated in their thinking as we are, and some great literature, some great songs came from there. You know what I mean? And uh, it flavours the pot. It flavours the pot. Uh, so what's that one? Yes. Leave it there. A lot of people said. Okay. That's enough of that, they said. <laughs>